I want to begin with a little story, uh, which is a story I read from the newsletter of my son's school in November 1995. And this is a story written by a girl named Rachel. And it's called The Monsters. A very, very long time ago, there was a beautiful world. The world was covered with beautiful trees, plants, and especially flowers. All the animals that lived there were happy. There were little fights, of course, but all in all, they were very happy. One day, something strange happened. Some new creatures were born. They were very peculiar. They were almost bald and weak. At first, the new creatures were okay, but slowly they became evil. After a long time, they became monsters. They ruined the world and killed the flowers and the plants. We killed the world. We are the monsters. When I read this in 1995, it came home to me what a powerful narrative we have constructed and foisted on our culture, especially our children, about sustainability and about the human relationship to the world. This was a story I was familiar with because I had studied environmental studies as a student in the 1970s, uh, university student, uh, and, and the dominant storyline about sustainability that emerged uh, from that teaching was a storyline about limits and constraints. It was about running out, it was about uh, ecosystem destruction, it was about carrying capacity uh, limitations, uh, early versions of the peak oil argument, and so on. Lots of good reasons for that story, lots of science behind it, but there's two problems, two really serious problems with this as a kind of narrative that we tell ourselves about how we interact with the world. And the first problem is it's not very motivating. People don't jump on the bandwagon of sacrifice, of cutting back, of doing without, of reducing. Uh, and this is a big problem because sustainability implies a societal transformation, a transformation uh, very profound and very wide-ranging across the whole planet. If we can't find a story that is motivating, that is energizing, that people want to belong to and be part of, we're going to fail at achieving sustainability, I believe. But there's a second kind of interesting reason that this storyline is problematic, and that is that it doesn't go far enough anyway. If we, talk, uh, if we have a story about limits and constraints that leads us to a set of uh, problems uh, or a set of solutions that are about cutting back, about harm reduction, damage limitation, mitigation, and so on, the logical extension of that is doing no harm. The logical extension of damage reduction is zero damage, what we sometimes call net zero. And that's just not good enough. We can't see human activity as something that we have to minimize because it's evil uh, and reduce damage as much as possible. We have to instead start to see human activity or at least look for human activity that is what we call regenerative. Can we have uh, human activity that we don't have to minimize because it actually improves both environmental and human well-being? That's regenerative sustainability. Everywhere we can be regenerative, it's better than cutting back or reducing harm. It's always better to create a positive than simply to reduce a negative. So we know that regenerative sustainability is better than mitigation uh, and harm reduction. What we don't know is where can we do it? Where can we be regenerative? Can we have regenerative buildings that make people better off in terms of health and well-being and make the environment better off? Can we have regenerative industrial processes, transportation systems? cities. Could we have a city that actually, because of the way it's designed and built, makes people healthier and happier and makes the environment better? Clearly, that's what we want to get to. The problem is we don't know where we can be regenerative because we've spent so much time trying to just reduce harm. We haven't focused on this question of creating positive good. But this is the new agenda. This is the sustainability agenda I think we should be pursuing. And I think universities have a really crucial role here because if anybody should be looking for where we can be regenerative, study, regenerative studying that and trying to implement it, it should be universities. And so we see the opportunity for universities to take a role in society uh, that is transformational. And this is the uh, idea of the university as a uh, living laboratory of sustainability that takes the concept of regenerative sustainability and turns it into a program for the whole campus. There's four reasons that universities can do something that no one else in society can do, or I should say post-secondary institutions can do something that nobody else in society can do. We have uh, 
that we are a single owner occupier of significant capital stock at a very interesting scale. What does that mean? In the case of UBC, it means we own 400 buildings on 400 hectares, about 15 million square feet. That's a really interesting scale. That's an urban neighborhood scale. And as the population of cities doubles around the planet in the next 50 years, every city in the planet is looking for solutions at the scale of their neighborhoods. Uh, we have a, we're a single owner-occupier. That means we live in what we build, we occupy what we build, and it's a single decision maker. Take 400 buildings downtown Vancouver, you've got thousands of decision makers. We have one. We can act. That's reason number one. Reason number two is we're a public institution. That means we can be more forgiving on payback rates. We, if we have an investment that meets academic needs, which is what we're there for, we can accept a 15-year payback. No private sector institution in the planet can accept a 15-year payback. They'll go to business. We can do stuff that others can't do. Third, we teach. And fourth, we do research. Nobody else has those four characteristics. So we can make ourselves a test bed. We can turn the whole campus into a living laboratory in which every single decision made is a decision about sustainability. And every one that we can, we attach research and teaching to. There it is. If you look at that, that's the UBC campus. You can get your hands around it. You can play with it. Turn it into a sandbox. Invite in the private sector. Come in and work with us on sustainability and take it out and commercialize. We don't commercialize. You do. Public sector, come in and work with us. You make policy. Uh, come and work with us on how to implement this and then take that out. NGOs, we need your help on social license to operate. We need your help on community engagement. Come in and work with us and then take it out to the world. University as a societal test bed and a sandbox for sustainability. That's the concept. I want to give you two examples of how that might uh, come to be. Uh, one at a building scale and one at the campus scale. And the building scale example is our Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability. This is a building that took us 10 years to get from concept to construction. Um, but it's a building that's designed around the idea of being a living lab in which every piece of the building, the paint, the glazing, the furniture, the energy system, everything is a research project over the whole life of the building and how to be more sustainable. Only, this can only happen in a post-secondary institution like a university where you can treat the whole thing as a $37 million research instrument. SIRS is designed to be sustainable, uh, to be regenerative in seven ways, four environmental and three human ways. Um, so I'm just going to walk you quickly through uh, each of those seven. On the environmental front, SIRS is designed to be net positive, that is regenerative in terms of energy, operational carbon, structural carbon and water quality. What does that mean? That means by adding a 60,000 square foot building to the campus, and CERS opened uh, a little uh, over a year and a half ago. By adding this building to campus, we reduce UBC's energy use. We don't reduce the building's energy use. The campus uses less energy because we added a building. We reduce UBC's carbon emissions. The campus emits less carbon because we added a building. We are 100% dependent on rainwater. We don't get water from the city, and we treat it all on site. We have full sewage treatment in the building, and the water leaving our building is better quality than the rain landing on the roof. The, the building purifies the water. And finally, the building sequesters more carbon because it's a wood building. Uh, and if there, by the way, if there's anywhere in the planet we should be living off the rain for our water and building out of wood, it's got to be BC. Uh, we sequester 600 tons of CO2 in that building, and that's more carbon than all the carbon emitted in building it by all the construction machinery and all the carbon emitted manufacturing everything inside the building. That makes us net positive in structural carbon, which we think is a big agenda item for the planet, is sequestering carbon. So there's the four environmental net positives. We also have three human net positives. This is a building that's designed and we'll see if we succeed in this, it's a building that's designed to turn occupants into inhabitants. An occupant is a passive recipient of a building. In your offices, maybe you can turn on the light and open the window, but that's about it. That's your total engagement with your building. Could you instead be an inhabitant? Could you have a sense of place in your building and a sense of engagement with your building and the people in it? That's our goal. And we have a whole suite of programs I don't have time to tell you about to, to try and convert occupants into inhabitants. But if we succeed, we think we can see th that will show up in three ways. So we're going to measure these three things. Health, productivity, 
happiness. We're going to measure health, productivity, and happiness in everyone in the building with a goal of continuous improvement over time. If we succeed in that, we're net positive in human terms. So we think a building can be regenerative, uh, but what about a campus? That's my second example, the UBC campus as a whole. I want to start, give you three examples. The first example at the campus scale is our climate change targets. Um, we reached Kyoto at UBC in our core academic buildings in 2007. What that means is the number of uh, square feet of floor space went up from 1990 to 2007 by 35 percent. Number of students went up 50 percent. CO2 emissions down 7 percent. Starting from that base, lower than 1990, our, here are our targets. 33 percent reduction by 2015, two years from now. 67% by 2020, 100% by 2050. Meanwhile, we're going to add 35% to the floor space of the campus. So we want to do have these reductions while increasing the campus by one third in terms of the building stock. That's a, that's a big uh, challenge to achieve these targets. Um, I just want to talk to you very briefly about the, the 2015 targets. That's the 33% you see there. We have four projects that are going to get us to that 33%, and the UBC Board of Governors has committed $150 million of capital investment to reach our 2015 climate targets. That's in a different order of magnitude than any other university I know in the world. $150 million. Four projects. One is the SERS building I mentioned. We're building a bioenergy. Well, we have built and are now operating a bioenergy plant running off wood waste. Um, to produce heat and electricity. That will save us a lot of uh, natural gas burning. Um, we're doing a continuous optimization program on 72 buildings across campus. And the big one, we're converting our whole steam district energy system, steam distribution, to hot water, which is way more efficient and uh, more friendly to renewables. That's $88 million cost, 14 kilometers of pipe being changed. So there's an example of how we're going to, those four projects will get us to 2015. Then we have the challenge of 2020, but we're well on the way. My second example is to make the point that it isn't just all about technology. This isn't just about energy systems. This is also about how we live. UBC, as some of you may know, used to be a commuter campus. Uh, there used to be this lemming-like migration of people from the B lots into the classes every hour. Um, all of those lots are now houses. And we are trying to transform the campus from a commuter campus to a complete living community. There were 10,000 people living in the UBC land in uh, 2001. There's going to be 40,000 before 2040, a quadrupling of the population. Once you get that kind of density, you can start doing very cool things with retail, trade, and with uh, transit, so they can be real live-work communities. And just to give you an example of what's happening, we have a housing action plan which is providing, uh, uh, we have a goal, we have more students living on UBC campus per capita than any university in the country and we want to double that from 25 to 50 percent. We're providing subsidy for faculty and staff to live on campus and providing uh, rental housing for that purpose. So there's a whole plan to build that community largely of, uh, with students, staff and faculty, although not exclusively so. Um, I'll give you just a couple of examples. Since 2007, sorry, since 1997 um, uh, to, to uh, 2011, uh, the number of people on campus has grown by two and a half times. The number of transit trips has quadrupled from 19,000 a day to 84,000 a day, partly because we gave a U-pass to students. The number of vehicle trips to campus has dropped about 20%. And the big one, parking spaces, about a 50% decline in parking spaces because these have been taken out of service and built on for housing. Housing is way more sustainable use of land than parking. It's also way more financially lucrative. So this is kind of cool uh, benefit that we get from doing this. So it's also about people. My third example um, is about the curriculum. We're going to transform the curriculum across the whole campus. We're going to create pathways so that every single student at UBC will be able to add sustainability content to their program, a pathway up to a minor, no matter what program they're in. So whether it's civil engineering or medieval history, doesn't matter, you will have be offered a pathway where you can add sustainability. And the point here is, we don't like the term green jobs. I don't think it's a useful term, uh, because it implies only those jobs are green. 
We think every job in the planet has sustainability content. No matter what you do, a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, a pipe fitter, a painter, doesn't matter, there is sustainability that's related to your job. Everybody can use sustainability content. So we're going to create these pathways and make them available to every student. That's a, a big challenge <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, the English department owns the English degree. Every department kind of owns their own degree. So we have to, effective, in effect, go to every unit on campus and every faculty on campus and work this through the system. But we're going to do it, and I think we may become the first university that makes sustainability available to every student on campus. So that's the, the third example I wanted to give about campus scale sustainability. We think if we succeed in these measures, we can transform the university. And we, uh, I want to summarize this all in terms of four verbs. If we can do these four things, then I think we're getting somewhere. The first is commit. We know students, faculty, and staff have pretty high ability to detect hypocrisy. In fact, people in general do. Uh, so if the commitment isn't there and it isn't real, if you're not walking the talk, uh, that will be seen. I think the $150 million gives you a sense that there is some real commitment at UBC, but we have to maintain that um, and show that and demonstrate that in what we do. Integrate. One problem with the university, uh, sort of like the way we organize society uh, outside the university, is it's very siloed. Uh, in our case, the silos are disciplines. And sustainability cuts across every discipline, as I've tried to indicate a minute ago. Uh, and so we need to integrate much better. We have to get way better at interdisciplinarity within the university, and we have to get way better at working with the community, what some people call trans-academic uh, engagement with the community around. So integration is crucial. Demonstration. In a way, my whole talk today is about demonstration, about using the campus. I'd like to see every university in the planet take on this agenda. Imagine a world in which every university, different sizes, different foci, different emphases, takes on this role of societal testbed. Then we have a planet of experimentation on sustainability, and we're doing it on the ground, we're researching the problems uh, associated with it, and we're teaching our students to take this out into the world. So uh, demonstration is crucial, I think. And if we do those three things, if we commit, integrate, and demonstrate, then maybe we can do the fourth. Maybe we can inspire our staff, we can inspire our faculty, and most importantly, because they are our ambassadors to the world, we can inspire our students. Thanks very much.